A couple of weeks ago, I got the opportunity to speak on behalf of another graduating class in Kentucky. And in preparation to speak for them, the school told me their class motto. And their class motto stuck with me. And so I want to share that same motto with you as well. Their class motto said, cherish yesterday, live for today, but then reach for tomorrow. I believe that those words are highly relevant for this context as well. Yesterday, all of you graduating class, you were in some level of school, whether it was high school, whether it was college, whether it was university, whether it was some certificate or diploma program, whether it was the army, you were in some level of school yesterday. And while you were there, you made some good friends. While you were there, you achieved some awesome accomplishments. While you were there, you learned some memorable lessons. And what I will tell you today is cherish those items. Cherish those things. However, those things were yesterday. The Ganyans will say, today be today. Today is the day. And today, you are graduating. And in graduating today, what I love so much is that as you are graduating, you're not going to let any coronavirus, social distancing, mandatory mask, or mandatory quarantines get in the way of your celebration. And so, class of 2020, whether you are graduating with a grade school degree, a bachelor's, master's, or terminal degree, whether you're graduating with a diploma or certificate, or whether you're graduating with the, I am just glad I got a degree, I want you to give a round of applause to yourselves for making it this far and for graduating in 2020. Yes, indeed. Yesterday, you were in school. Today, you are graduating. And so for the next few minutes, what I would like to do is that I would like to talk to you a little bit about how to reach for tomorrow. That's what I want to talk to you about today, how to reach for tomorrow. I'll begin this way. I don't know if you guys know this man over here. Well, of course you do. The greatest basketball player to ever live. His name is Michael Jordan. And a couple of months ago in April, they had a documentary series about Michael Jordan. According to credible sources, they say 6.1 million people watched this series. I watched it as well. They say that that was the most watched ESPN documentary series. I asked myself a question, a question you should be asking. I asked myself, why? Here are some reasons I came up with. Reason number one, why did so many people watch it? Well, it's coronavirus time and everyone is home and they're bored. That's reason number one. Reason number two, why did everyone watch it? Why did so many people watch this docuseries? Here's the second reason why I believe. I believe that Michael Jordan wasn't just a basketball player or a good basketball player. Instead, Michael Jordan was a winner. And the truth of the matter is this. Whether people would like to admit it or not, the truth of the matter is this. In life, everyone is attracted to a winner. You don't have to like the winner. You don't have to be friends with a winner. But everyone in life, no matter what field this is, people are attracted to winners. The reason why we are attracted to winners is because oftentimes winners have qualities that we want but we don't yet have. Oftentimes, we are attracted to winners because winners give us a vision of what is possible. Oftentimes, we are attracted to winners because the truth of the matter is this, we want to be winners ourselves. Come on, nobody wants to be a loser. We are attracted to winners. And today, I am happy and I am proud to announce that class of 2020, you all are some winners today. Oh man, I thought I would get an applause on that one. You all are winners today. Yes, indeed, you all are winners. And you are winners because you made it through difficult exams. Today, you are winners. You are winners because you pulled those all-nighters in order to finish those papers. Today, you are winners. 
You are winners because many of you juggled school, work, and family in order to accomplish your degree. Today, you are winners. You are winners because you fought those difficult professors who were not trying to give you a higher grade, and you prevailed against those professors. Today, you are winners. You are winners because even for my high schoolers, you dealt with the pressures and anxieties of being a teenager going through puberty in high school, and you were able to come out victorious. Today, you are winners, and more so, today you are winners because even in the midst of a coronavirus, you were still able to get your degree. Today, you are winners, and please give yourselves a round of applause for being winners today. But class of 2020, listen to me carefully. Even though today you are winners, at the same time, I need to remind you that tomorrow is coming. My Lord, tomorrow is coming. And tomorrow is coming with its new set of obstacles. Tomorrow is coming with the obstacles of new and challenging teachers. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming with the obstacles of new and difficult subjects. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming with the obstacles of new and unfamiliar classmates. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming with the obstacles of new and dirty roommates in college. Help us, somebody. Tomorrow is coming. Or maybe you were that dirty roommate. OK, who knows? Tomorrow is coming. Or even for those who just graduated college, tomorrow is coming with the obstacles of new payments on your student loans. Come on, somebody. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming for those who are entering into the workforce. Tomorrow is coming with the obstacle of a challenging economy. Tomorrow is coming. And so class of 2020, please hear me closely. Even though today you have won, please don't get complacent with your victory because the only way to face the unknown challenges of tomorrow is to keep on winning. Or let me say it to wait. The only way to face the unknown challenges of tomorrow is to stay winning. That's where my sermon title comes from, to stay winning. And so that's what I want to challenge you to do in these next few minutes. I want to challenge you to stay winning. If we didn't have the mass and the coronavirus, I'll tell everybody to say the word stay winning. But now everybody just keep quiet, you know. We don't want nothing in the air. Stay winning. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to share with you some recommendations from God's word that will help you and I to stay winning. Those recommendations come from the text that Jason read so beautifully. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 24 through 27. The Bible says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? Run in such a way that you will win the prize. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Verse 26, so I run with purpose in every step, and I'm not just shadow boxing. I strike a blow to my own body. The Greek says, I give myself a black eye, just like an athlete in training, so that I can do what my body needs to do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself will be disqualified. A few recommendations on how to stay winning. Here is the first recommendation. Class of 2020, if you're going to stay winning as you go into the unknown obstacles of tomorrow, the first thing that you must do, the first thing I need you to do is that I need you to develop a champion's mindset. If you're going to stay winning, the first thing I need you to do is that I need you to develop a champion's mindset. You see, in every professional sport, whether it is football, whether it is volleyball, whether it is soccer, whether it is basketball, we always have two types of players. The first type of player that we have is that we have players who just play in order to play. We call these type of players pretenders. And then we have players who play in order to win. These players, we call them contenders. And my question today is that are you going to be a pretender or are you going to be a contender? 
You see, pretenders have a participation mindset. They are just satisfied to play the game. But contenders have a champion's mindset. They are only satisfied when they win the game. You see, some of you are just satisfied to finally get into university or finally get into college. That's a participation mindset. You are only being a pretender. But then others, when they get into university, they say, I'm going to be the best that I'm going to be. That's a champion's mindset. That's a contender. You see, pretenders have a participation mindset. They always come up with a new excuse. But contenders have a champion's mindset. They are always coming up with a new adjustment. Are you a pretender or are you a contender? Pretenders have a participation mindset. They only do the minimum that is required of them. But contenders have a champion's mindset. They do even more that is required of them. Pretenders have a participation mindset. So they are always worried about what the haters are saying about them. So they go on Facebook and they say, my enemies are trying to destroy me. Or they go on WhatsApp and they say, my haters don't want me to shine. But listen to me carefully. Contenders have a champion's mindset. They're not worried about what the haters have to say about them. Instead, they use their haters as their motivators to elevate them to another level. My question to you today is that are you a pretender or are you a contender? Because the only way to keep on winning after 2020 is to have a champion's mindset. You see, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, what mindset are you going into the unknown with? Because everyone can run the race, but not everyone wins the prize. So Paul says, run in such a way that you can win the prize. If you believe God's word, let me hear you say amen. amen. The first recommendation is this. If you are going to stay winning, you need to develop a champion's mindset. But I got a second recommendation for you. I don't have a long sermon today. I have a second recommendation for you. If you're going to stay winning, if you're going to stay winning, you need to develop Strict discipline, my Lord. Nobody likes that word discipline. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. You need to develop strict discipline. You see, the reason why nobody likes the word discipline is because discipline is hard. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to somebody today? Come on, y'all. Discipline is hard. I got a little experience about discipline. A couple years ago, it was only two, I came back from a country, country was called Australia, great country. I came back from that country, and my mother saw me as soon as I got out of that country. Oh, no, 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 you are too big, you are too big, you have to go back. She was making fun of me because I had gained weight in Australia. So I shaved off like 10 pounds, but the pounds didn't stay off. And so last year, when I started my job at Clifton Church, just to humor myself, I went on the weighing scale to check my, my, my weight. Now, I usually don't like to go and see it because I always say, what you don't know can't hurt you. But I don't know, I decided to go check it out. I went and I saw that I was 50 pounds overweight. I said, Lord have mercy. You know, I think what frustrated me the most, what made me depressed the most, is that when I calculated my BMI, my BMI was saying obese. I said, oh no, oh no, oh no. Saying okay. I said, I've never seen those words associated with me. They said, oh, I said, obese. Oh, no. And so I said, man, I got to get to work. I got to get to work. I got to drop these pounds. 50. Come on, y'all. 50 is not no joke. Can I get a witness, somebody? Come on. To lose one pound is an accomplishment. Talk to me, church. 50. Come on. Come on. So, so I said, let me get to work. Y'all want to know what I did? Talking about developing strict discipline. My first thing. My first thing is that, you guys don't know this about me, but I'll betray my sins now. I'm addicted to juice. Love juice. I can knock out a whole bottle of juice in two days by myself. And so I said, no, nah, if I'm going to drop these pounds, the first thing I got to do is that I got to cut out juice. That was like an alcoholic trying to stop alcohol. It was so hard. It was so difficult. But notice very carefully, I had to take what everyone 
discipline. It was hard. It was hard. That's what we call it, hard. So that's the first thing I did. I cut out juice. I cut out sweets. But then the second thing is that they said I had to move. I had to exercise a little bit. So I went to the gym, got a membership, and I found this machine right here. Y'all know that machine? It's called a Stairmaster. You should just call it the Stairmaster of Death. I decided to get on that machine five days a week, and every day I was committed to burning 700 to 800 calories a day. A day. Do you know what we call that? We call that hard. At a certain point, I'll be on the machine, and the people who are in charge of Planet Fitness had to tell me to come and be quiet because I was crying too much being on that machine. Do you know what we call it? We call it hard. But then I said one more thing. I said one more thing. I said, once a week, I decided to do what I call a partial fasting. And so what I would do is that instead, by the way, I don't enjoy fasting that much. Don't think I'm not spiritual, but I just love food. And once a week, I would do a smoothie fasting. Now, the smoothie wasn't like smoothie cake. This was all that was in my smoothie. Fruits. Vegetable and water. That's the worst smoothie you can drink. Let me tell you guys something. With those smoothies, it's like the day I was drinking those smoothies, I would see food everywhere I go. I don't know if you ever experienced that before. It's like everything was food. Every commercial was food. Every billboard was food. Let me tell you, I've been a vegetarian since 2011. But the night when I would drink the smoothies, I would dream about cheeseburgers that night. That's how bad it was. That was called, come on, y'all, that's called hard, difficult. But one day, one day, I just went on the scale. I looked down, checked my weight, saw that I had dropped 20 pounds. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. A year later, a year later, a year later, I've dropped all 50 pounds, and now when I put it on the BMI, it says normal health way. I said, praise the Lord. Come on. Come on, somebody. Follow me carefully, those who are listening. This is the blessing of discipline, strict discipline, because what discipline does is that discipline is the bridge that takes you from your dreams to your reality. Develop strict discipline. Discipline is the boat that gets you from what you are to what you want to be. You need to develop strict discipline. Discipline is the plane that takes you from possibility to actualities. It's time to develop strict discipline. Therefore, I always say, learn how to deal with the pain pain of discipline today or else you will have to learn how to deal with the pain of regret tomorrow. Listen to me carefully. We must develop strict discipline because even though it is hard, we only accomplish something worthwhile in life if we are willing to do something that is hard. That's why the Apostle Paul can say in chapter 9, verse 25, that all athletes who compete in the games, they go through strict training. Later on in verse 27, he says, I go to the point where I strike a blow to my body. The Greek says that he gives himself a black eye so that he can discipline himself, so that he can win the prize. And in the same sort of way, if you look at athletes in our day and age, the ones who win are the ones who have strict discipline. I can recall people like Kobe Bryant, who said that he would not leave the gym until he makes 800 shots a day. Listen, he didn't say until he takes 800 shots a day. He said until he makes 800 shots a day. But that's why he can have five championships, strict discipline. If you look at Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods would practice 16 hours a day in order to perfect his swing. That's why he is one of the greatest golfers that have ever lived. He is a champion because of strict discipline. If you look at Serena Williams, she has been practicing tennis since she was the age 
three, at the age three, I couldn't even say the word tennis. That is why she is the greatest female tennis player to play even till this day, because she developed strict discipline. And what all of these athletes understand that many of us do not understand is that in order to be or in order to do what nobody else will do, you have to do what nobody else was willing to do as well. You know, all the time people come to me and say, oh, oh Pastor, especially in my church, Pastor Kojo, I want to lose weight like you. But I say, do you want to do what I did to lose weight like me? You see, the success is not in what you want to do. The success is if you're willing to do what we did. The key is in the did. Develop strict discipline. But then there's a final recommendation that Paul gives to us if you're going to stay winning. First, he says, if you're going to stay winning, class of 2020, you have to develop a champion's mindset. Don't just run in order to run. Run in order to win. Be a contender, not a pretender. Second, if you're going to win, stay winning. You need to develop strict discipline. Paul says every athlete who goes to the games develops strict training. But then finally, if you're going to stay winning, then you need to develop your why. You need to develop your why. Your why is your reason for doing what you do. Your why, your why is your mission. Your why is your purpose. You need to develop your why, and here's why. Because after you develop your why, then you need to begin focusing on your why. Follow church. You need to begin focusing. So first, you got to develop it. But then second, you got to what? Focus on it. I've done this illustration at this particular church before, but because most people don't remember sermons, I'll do it again. I went to Houston five years ago, six years ago. And while I was there, I was talking to a pastor. And I asked the pastor, how are you such a successful leader? What he did is that he found two balls that were sitting around him. And he began to do something, something I, I never forget. He said, Kojo, this is what I do. And he, he took the two balls in his hand. He said, Kojo, what I do is that I find a, he said, I find a fixed point to look at. Watch me now. He said, I find a fixed point to focus on. Then he began tossing up the balls like this. He said, then Kojo, I just stay focused. He said, so because I'm focused on my mission, I got no time for distractions. I'm focused. Because I'm focused on my mission, got no time for laziness. I'm focused. Because I'm focused on my, dis my mission, no time for adultery. Kojo, I'm focused. Because I'm focused on my mission, no time for quitting. Kojo, I'm focused. And my question to everyone in the class of 20 today is, are you focused on your mission as well? You see, because when you are focused on your mission, being focused on your mission eliminates distractions. And so focus on that mission. When you are focused on that mission, being focused on your mission prevents you from getting discouraged and quitting. Therefore, focus on your mission. When you are focused on your mission, it helps you pay the price in order to win the prize. Therefore, stay focused on your mission. In Paul's time, the Greek athletes were continually focused on their mission. Their mission was to attain this wreath or to attain this crown. The problem, though, is that when they attained this wreath or when they attained this crown, the problem with this wreath or the problem with this crown is that it was only a temporary wreath. It was only a temporary crown. And so eventually, the crown will end up dying, or worst of all, the crown will end up perishing. Therefore, the Apostle Paul says that in order to stay winning, it is not enough to develop your why. Neither is it enough to only focus your why, but you must also elevate your why. He says we must not only strive for the crown which is perishable, but we must also strive 
for that crown which is imperishable as well. We should not only strive for that crown which is temporary, but we must also strive for that crown which is eternal. That is why I must say this statement today. If your why in life is only to get a good job, then your why is not complete. If your why in life is only to get good grades, then your why is not complete. If your why in life is only to get another degree, then your why is not complete. If your why in life is so that you can live in a big house and have an American dream, then your why is not complete. If your why in life is so that you can build more houses and buy more lands back home in Ghana, then your why is not complete. If your why is so that you can get a promotion and be a senior manager in your company, if that's your why, then your why is not complete. If your why is only so that you can own a business or become an entrepreneur, that's okay. But your why is not complete because your why can only be complete when it originates from, flows from, and gives glory back to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only why that is worth something. Because only Jesus is the one who can give you and I that crown which will never perish. Therefore, class of 2020, I conclude on this. If you are going to stay winning, then the ultimate secret to stay winning in this race is that you must keep your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thoroughly believe that when you keep your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, graduates, hear me carefully. I thoroughly believe that when you keep your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then no weapon that is formed against you can ever prosper. Yes, indeed. Whether it is the weapon of discouragement, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of difficult subjects, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of challenging professors, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of Sally May and student loans, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of personal tragedies or life tragedies, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of your own difficulties themselves, no weapon. Whether it is the weapon of haters and enemies who do not want you to succeed, no weapon or even whether it is the weapon of the devil himself no weapon formed against you can prosper so long as you keep your trust in Jesus therefore in order to stay winning I leave one verse with you and I hope this one verse guides you for the rest of your life the verse is found in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and it says trust in the Lord with not some of your heart with not most of your heart, but with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths so that you can stay winning. May the good Lord bless you today. <laughs>